Welcome everyone to Tucson Audubon's presentation, uh, Inviting Pollinators to Your Yard. I'm very excited to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Kim Matsushino, who is our Habitat at Home Coordinator. She's been with Tucson Audubon since 2015. She's very knowledgeable on all things uh, inviting of native um, animal species to your yard, birds included. So. Uh, we're excited to have her talk today about pollinators. This is part of our recipe card series. Um, we have uh, a whole line of recipe cards that talks about inviting different species or groups of species to your yard. So this is the latest in our series talking about pollinators specifically. If you're interested in those other recipe cards, um, we have already done a talk on a few of them, including Lucy's Warblers, uh, and those are available on our YouTube page. Uh, this recording will also be uploaded to our YouTube page um, after we, we're finished the event, so you can find all of those in one place. So I'll go ahead and I'll turn it over to Kim, and she's going to talk to us about pollinators. Thanks so much for being here, and thanks, Kim, for talking to us. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. Let me just get my screen up really quick. Everyone see it? Yeah, okay, cool. All righty. So, yeah, so today we're gonna be doing pollinators. Um, so this is for our recipe card labeled pollinators. Um, so today we're mainly gonna be talking about um, native bees, butterflies, and moths. We do have a recipe card for bats um, that we'll be discussing later on in the series. I'm not sure exactly what date that will be. So that's why we're not covering bats today. All right. Uh, so we all know that Southern Arizona has an amazing diversity of birds, but we also have a great diversity of native pollinators. So there are around 3000 butterfly and moth species that have been named and um, ID'd in Southern Arizona. Um, we also have 28 bat species, 1300 native bee species, which is really special because we have probably the largest diversity of native bees of anywhere in the world. And we'll talk about why that is a little bit later. Um, we also have wasps that pollinate and flies that pollinate. So I won't be covering those because I don't know a whole lot about them today. So this is our pollinator recipe card. Um, so we'll explain why your yard is a good place for pollinators. And we'll introduce you to a few species of the many, very many native bees, butterflies, and moths. And then we'll go over how to create habitat in your backyard for pollinators. Oops. All right, so native bees. So this photo is by Stephen Buckman, um, and it illustrates the huge diversity within native bees. Um, the diversity is not only in size, but color, feeding strategies, nesting, and social behaviors. So the big bee is a female carpenter bee. She's the largest native bee, um, and a generalist feeder, meaning that she will pretty much feed on any species of plant, any family of plants, um, so very in-depth with the capabilities of, of getting nectar and pollen from a lot of flowers. Um, and the little guy is a Perdita. Um, that is the smallest bee, Perdita minima, which is a fitting name. Um, these guys are less than two millimeters long um, and they specialize on plants in the spurge family. So little tiny flowers. So worldwide, there are 20,000 species of native bees. There are 3,600 known species in North America. And then, like I said earlier, there's about 1,300 in Arizona. Um, so deserts support the most diversity of native bees. And I have a great um, map here on the next slide that I'll show you. All right, so this map just came out in 2020 and it shows the bee diversity um, around the world. So you can see in Arizona, we're over here and see how dark red it is. Um, that just shows 
how many bees we have and we're so lucky to have them. Um, so the study confirmed that unlike other creatures such as birds and mammals, more bee species are found in dry temperate areas away from poles than in tropical environments near the equator. Um, so they found through this study that there are far fewer bee species in forests and jungles than there are in the deserts. And um, they think mainly because trees tend to not provide um, as many resources as flowering plants do. Um, the ground conditions in the desert are a lot better to dig in since most of the native bees we have dig their nests in the ground. So we have dry, um, grainy soil instead of really wet kind of clay soils that you see in, in more wet northeastern conditions. Um, we also have a huge plant diversity here. So if we have a lot of plants, then we're also gonna get a huge diversity of native bees. And a lot of these bees have great adaptations for desert climates. So um, native bees go through a phase of diapause, uh, which allows them to wait for the right time to emerge. So they can wait until the best time to build and forage. So whenever the plants that they really like to feed on are blooming is when they're going to emerge. So they have the ability to wait quite a while to emerge just to ensure that they're going to have food to eat and foraging materials that they need. All right, so this is a lot. <laughs> um, these are a couple graphs um, that represent the lifestyles of native bees. So the smaller graph on the right is a little bit easier to, to read. So as you can see, there's only 10% of all the bees are social, which are like your honeybees, the ones that live all together in a big hive or have one queen. Only 10% of them are, are social. So that's gonna be just your European honeybee, which isn't native, um, and then also um, bumblebees. bumblebees. Bumblebees are a little bit different than honeybees in that they only have seasonal colonies and the fertilized female only hibernates and then lays the eggs. And then the majority are solitary, meaning that they only meet up to mate and then the female will make and provision her nest all on her own. And then lastly, there's parasitic uh, bees, which means they're kind of like cowbirds in that they will lay their eggs in other bees' nests. And we'll go over a couple of those later. Okay. And then another good way to distinguish native bees or categorize them is through their nesting habits. Um, so 70% of the solitary bees actually nest in the ground. Um, so they dig their hole in the ground, um, sometimes several feet deep which is a pretty amazing thing considering these guys are less than an inch long. Um, so let's see. This is a video of ground nesting bees. These are actually diadasia. So they're kind of the cactus bees. Um, so you can see this video. She just makes these incredible nests and this single female just builds this nest like all by herself and then on top of that she makes these great chimneys um out of saliva mud and they fact actually found pollen in these little tunnels as well so this is just a video um of some of these bees just it's just i thought it was a great video so it's only a 30 seconds but So yeah, if you see any of these chimney looking things, it's gonna be a great aggregation of native desert bees. So don't stomp on them. They're not anthills, they're bees. Um, and then this photo here kind of shows a tunnel. So this particular bee species, so they will shake like some, oh, there's, there's so many different types. So these types of ground nesting bees, um, single females 
will share the same entrance. However, they will make offshoots for themselves. So they're never going to share a, like a little tube, offshoot tube with another female. It's going to be female one, female two, female three, and so on. And she will lay her eggs simultaneously from the back to the front. Um, and then she provisions each cell with pollen and nectar that she's foraged for, which allows the baby bees to eat those little cell dividers on their way out before they emerge. So I have a better picture of it later. So those are ground nesting bees. And then the other major type of nesting um, for native bees are cavity nesters. So these are the ones that are gonna be nesting in like wooden blocks or dry pithy stems. Uh, I've also seen them in dry yucca stalks or soto stalks. Um, yeah, and so they'll, they'll go ahead and, and clear out the pithy insides of these stems. And just like the ground nesting bees, they will make these cells, lay an egg, put up a wall divider, and within these little cells, she will leave, like I think they call it bee bread, which is a mixture of pollen and nectar. The little larva will eat the pollen and nectar and the wall and they will emerge out the hole. Um, this is a video of, of just mason bees going in and out. So you can see that she'll go in, do her thing, come back out and she does that repeatedly until that hole is pretty much filled. And then she caps it off with either mud or leaf cutter bees will um, actually wrap like their little larva in a piece of leaf and then close it up with a leaf as well. There's so many different types of bees and how they like to finish their nests. Okay. But anyway, all right. So those are cavity nesting bees. All right. So here's a better diagram of the life cycle. Um, so males and females will emerge from their winter sleep. Um, when they wake up, they will mate, the males will die, and the females will go ahead and go try to find a hole that will make a good nest for her. Um, and she will spend the rest of her life um, gathering pollen and nectar and laying eggs. Um, and then it just happens all over again. So these guys will emerge when in the spring usually or whenever the flower of their choice is blooming. And you can see here that this is that bee bread. And then the, the larva didn't hatch, so that's why the bee bread's still in there. So a little bit of native bee versus honey bee facts. Um, honey bees don't want to sting you, but they do have a job to protect their hive. Um, and when they do sting you, they do die, so they don't want to die. They don't want to <laughs> hurt you, um, but they do have a job to do. Native bees, however, don't have a colony to protect, don't have a queen to protect, so they rarely sting. Um, and some of the papers that I've read say that the, the stingers that they do have are so tiny that it's really won't penetrate, penetrate your skin that much, and they don't want to hurt you either. So since they have nothing to really protect and they're just on their own, they just mind their own business and are the great they're just great pollinators to have in your backyard just because there's no threat really at all. All right, so native bees is pollinators. Um, as pollinators, they are fantastic because they collect both pollen and, and nectar to make their nests. Um, they are specialist feeders sometimes or generalist feeders, so sometimes Certain bee species will only pollinate certain families of flowers. Um, but most of them are generalists, meaning that they will forage on a variety of plants. Um, they're also great pollinators because they tend to forage for longer periods of time and more frequently than honeybees. They've also co-evolved with native plants, so they know exactly when these plants bloom and how best to access the pollen. Um, some of them also have the ability to buzz pollinate, which where they like vibrate their abdomen so hard that the pollen kind of just shoots out and just collects on them, like you see in these photos. Um, 
so the photo, the leftmost photo is a honeybee. Um, you can see that it's a little less hairy than the native bees on the right. Um, so on the bottom, the little green guy is a sweat bee. And you can see that his pollen baskets on his hind legs are completely full, but it's also carrying a bunch of pollen all over its body because they're just so hairy, it just sticks to them, which is great for pollination. Um, and then the mason bee up top, you can just see how much pollen she has all over her body. It's just so cute. All right. uh, so these are, I picked just a few bee species to go over that you are most likely to see in your backyard. Um, so these are leaf cutter and mason bees. They're in the family of Megacalidae. Um, the female leaf cutter bees here on the bottom um, use leaves um, to partition their cells and close off their nests. Most of these species live above ground in wood or hollow twigs, but there are a few that will nest in the ground. And instead of carrying pollen on their hind legs, these guys carry pollen on their abdomens. So a good way to ID these, these bees is to look for yellow patches on their bellies. So they have a the head that's as big as their thorax. Um, they have big mandibles or teeth. So especially the leaf cutter bees, just because they have to cut those, those leaves in perfect circles. So that's why they have bigger mandibles. Um, they're usually metallic green, um, about seven to 20 millimeters. So it's a big difference because there's so many different species within these families, but um, they're all gonna be solitary. Uh, what else? Let's see. And this is the biggest family, like 10% of the native bees that we have are leaf cutter and mason bees. And they're generalists, so they're gonna feed on most, most anything. All right, these are sweat bees. These are the most <laughs> beautiful bees that I've seen. Um, they are a huge, diverse family. Um, so most of them are solitary, but there are a few species that are parasitic um, and they nest above ground and they have some of them nest in the ground. So it's just dependent on species, whether they're going to nest in tunnels or in the ground. And then some of the sweat bees, like I mentioned earlier, will have these communal nesting sites where they share an entrance, but then have their own little cavities there. Right, so these are mining bees. Oops, did it go? Okay. Mining bees. Um, yeah, so these are black or dull metallic. Um, they usually have like reddish hairs on them and elongated scopa. Um, so this family includes Perdita, which are like the smallest native bees that we have. So you can see this guy, the yellow guy is, is feeding on velvet mesquite flowers. So you can just imagine how small those flowers are. And then this bee is just, just in that tiny flower. So they're really, really small. And then this, the Adrena species, this guy here, um, really loves globe mallow. So their feeding strategy is, is primarily globe mallow flowers. All right, so these are longhorn bees. As you can see from the picture, they have very long antennae. Um, they're usually pretty robust and very hairy. They're often dark. They have really dark bodies um, with pale hair bands on their abdomen. They have dense scopa, which are the little pollen carrying sacs on their hind legs. And the males in this case have the really long antenna. And most often they're as long or if not longer than their bodies. Um, so again, these are solitary two communal grounding nesting bees. Um, so that means they would either nest primarily on their own and not share a, a opening or they will share an opening just depending on the species. And these guys are especially attracted to asters, sunflowers and mallows. All right, squash bees. 
Um, squash bees, they're about the same size and color as the honeybee. You can tell the difference between the two of them when they're foraging. So squash bees know exactly how the blossoms work when they open and where the pollen is. Squash bees will arrive earlier than honeybees and dive right down into the flower and get what they need and then quickly leave. <laughs> and then honeybees will show up later after the flowers pass the prime and hover over the flower determining the best way to get into it. Uh, so if you do see a, a couple of bees, you could tell the difference between a squash bee and a honeybee just by their, their efficiency in pollinating. So if they're like struggling and not knowing what to do, it's probably a honeybee if they knows exactly what to do. It is most likely going to be a squash bee. Uh, carpenter bees, I think we all have seen carpenter bees. Um, so they really like salvias and penstemon and other flowers that are really long and tubular. You think of hummingbird plants. Um, so they often can do nectar robbing, which is kind of cool, is where they, instead of going into the flower, since they're so big, they will cut an opening towards the end of the flower. Um, they'll use their mouth, mouth parts and cut a slit at the base of the corolla and steal the nectar from the flower. So it, it doesn't actually pollinate too much because it's going straight for the nectar underneath the stamens where the pollen is and just takes the nectar and kind of just leaves. So that's why they call it um, nectar rubbing. And then carpenter bees are cool in that they are long lived so they can live up to three years. Um, and there can be one or two generations per year. And then this photo of the carpenter bee uh, tunnel is just crazy. It's so big, um, but really, really cool. <laughs> Uh, so these are cactus bees. These are what the tunnels of the previous video I was showing you was. Not the same species, but same family. So this is a picture um, that one of my friends Sherry Massey took of a, of a cactus bee in one of her cactus flowers. And I just thought that was the most beautiful picture, so I keep putting it everywhere. Um, so cactus bees are in the same family as a squash bee, and they do share a lot of the same characteristics. But instead of specializing on squash and gourds, these guys specialize on cactus, especially choya and prickly pears. All right, cuckoo bees. So these are the parasitic bees. Um, the cuckoo bees make up one large group within the Apidae family that are exclusively parasitic. Um, so cuckoo bees are usually red or yellow. Sometimes they have white markings on them. And then through time, they have lost all their pollen carrying adaptations as they don't need to collect pollen to feed their young because they are, I mean, putting their kids onto someone else so they don't need to make any nests. Um, you can find them flying around in the early spring over bare ground where they are searching for potential host nests. Um, and they usually go to nests that are in the mining bee family. Um, so the female will wait for the resident female to leave the nest and then will go into that nest and lay her eggs and then <laughs> sneak out before she comes back. Um, some species will go the extra step in killing the resident larva while others don't. Um, so it just depends on the species. And then, um, so when they do lay the eggs, the, the cuckoo bees larva grow faster and larger than their host larva. So they will eat not only the larva, but also the provisions that their mom has, has made them. So it's sad, but kind of cool as well. Okay, so those are a tiny, tiny bit of, of native bees. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about butterflies and moths that you can commonly see in your backyards. Um, so butterflies and moths as pollinators, why they're important? Uh, because butterflies and moths have the ability to travel far distances, they um, improve gene flow between plant populations. Um, a lot of them are also specialist pollinators, especially the moths, um, and they do, do do a lot in nocturnal pollination. 
Um, so butterfly and moth life cycle. So adults will lay the eggs on their host plant. And host plants, is, as a lot of you know, can be very specific to certain species. And there are a lot of butterfly and moth species that are generalists in what they, they lay their eggs on. So after the eggs are laid, the eggs hatch into caterpillars. Um, and then the caterpillars will eat their host plant and grow up to be very big. And then the caterpillars become pupae and form a chrysalis or a cocoon for moths. And then after all that, they um, emerge as adults and then mate and go eat. <laughs> uh, giant swallowtail. So this is the first one. This is the largest butterfly in the United States, um, about four inches long. You usually see their shadow before you see them. Um, they're very graceful flyers, strong flaps and short glides. The adults are dark and yellow above and more yellow on their underside. Uh, you'll mostly see them um, around citrus trees because that's their larval host plant. Uh, and then I'm sure most people have seen these bird poop looking caterpillars. <laughs> um, so that's just a defense mechanism that they've evolved to look like really look like bird poop, but they're actually little caterpillars. So if you want to attract giant swallowtails, citrus and hop trees are, are great for them. Another swallowtail is the pipe vine swallowtail. Um, they're beautiful dark blue with orange and yellow accents. They're a little bit smaller than giant swallowtail, um, but still about three inches big. Um, they do have a rapid flight, um, which is very noticeable, and, and they usually are flying uh, low to the ground. Their caterpillars are, are pretty terrifying. Um, we just got to imagine what they're going to look like soon. Um, and their host plant is the pipevine, which actually contains noxious chemicals that makes the caterpillars distasteful to predators and predators have learned that they taste bad and have learned to not eat them. Um, yeah, so growing pipe vine, you will definitely get some swallowtails. Okay. Uh, Gulf fritillaries, uh, this is one of my favorite. Um, these are pretty common to the Southern regions. Um, and are easily attracted by a passion vine. Um, I have one passion vine in my yard. I've had it for probably three years. I've never seen it bloom because every, <laughs> every year it gets demolished multiple times by Gulf fritillaries. So one day maybe it'll bloom, but I highly doubt it just because there's always caterpillars on it. And somehow they have enough food to eat on that sad vine to, to make it. So. It's definitely worth it. Their larvae are pretty scary as well, but you learn to love them. Um, super easy to attract. I mean, they, it's just amazing how they know where their host plants are and, and they always come back. So it's a great and easy way to attract um, some beautiful butterflies. It's just putting up a, a passion vine. Um, marine blues are very beautiful, um, really iridescent, metallic-y color. Um, their, their flight is very fast and erratic, so they have to wait until a good time to when they kind of settle down to see how beautiful they are. Um, to attract them, their host plants are legumes. So velvet mesquite's a great, great tree, as well as fragrant bee bush, Alusia um, as their as their host plants. And they have tiny little very inconspicuous caterpillars. All right, so this is the queen, queen butterfly, um, same family as the monarch and commonly mistaken for monarchs. I've done that a lot, um, but they are common in Tucson year round, um, found really in any open habitat. Um, the best way to to distinguish a queen from a monarch is for me in their larval phase, just because even though the caterpillars do look 
just like the monarchs, you can tell that it's a queen if they have three sets of antenna. So monarchs are only gonna have two sets, but the queens have this third set here in the middle. So that's the best way to do it. And then when they're adults, um, the veining patterns. Um, so unlike monarchs, queens don't have those thick black veins in the between like their bright orange. Um, and the queens have white spots that spread onto the forewing, whereas the monarchs don't. And their larval host plant, like monarchs, is, is milkweed. Oh, I don't know what this is. Oh, this is a video I took at Desert Meadows Garden in Green Valley, just a ton of queens all over this desert willow. It was, it was amazing. Uh, oh boy. Okay, uh, so monarch. So, yeah, I thought I, okay, never mind. Um, so, uh, these two pictures on the left show the difference between a male and a female. So, if you've ever wanted to know random facts about monarchs, here's one. Uh, males have these dots on their back wings. So, these yeah, these two spots. So if you see a monarch that has two spots, it's gonna be a male. The females don't have those. Um, yeah, so there's been a lot of research done with the, the Western monarch population. Um, it's, there's not a lot known since they haven't really been studying them for too long, um, but they have, caught the eye of researchers in the past 20 years. So there's, so there's some good conservation going on. But um, monarchs, you can find them here in the low desert um, from September to October is their peak migration. Um, May to June, they'll leave to the higher elevations where they continue to breed. And then August, August through September, they'll move back to the lower desert to lay their eggs. Um, and then those offspring will join the main migration to California. Um, uh, this a study came out a couple years ago specifically for what was the best milkweed for Western monarchs. And what they came out with is what they what they found was that Arizona milkweed, um, Asclepius angustifolia, was the best milkweed for caterpillars in that it was more commonly visited and laid eggs upon by the females. Um, the caterpillars had a higher survival rate um, and the adults that the caterpillars formed eating Arizona milkweed were, were larger and stronger. Um, the second place winner was the pine leaf milkweed, um, so Sclepius linaria. So that came out in 2019. And then this study came out, God, I think I got this email a couple months ago. So 2020 was really bad for the Western monarch population. I think it dropped down to 2000 individuals were counted last year at the wintering sites in California. Um, so in 2021, the Xerces Society's Thanksgiving count um, announced that they counted 247,200 <laughs> so almost 250,000 um, individuals of the Western monarch population last year. So 2,000 to 250,000 is, is really a great increase, but um, it's, it's hard to tell if it is a recovery or a trend or a blip. Um, so there's no definitive answers as to why this big population spike has happened yet. Um, the Xerxes say said there's, this isn't um, a recovery since in the 1980s, the populations of the Western monarchs were in the low millions. So we're still in a huge decline. Um, so I'm interested to see what they come up with as to why there's this really big spike in population. So I'll keep you updated from when I hear why this happened, but it's great. 
really great to see those numbers go up. All right, so some moths. I'm sure a lot of you have seen these in your yards this past spring and summer. I sure have. Um, so this guy, um, the rustic sphinx. So I have had this demolish a few of my plants, but they've all survived and come back, which is nice. So this is the rustic sphinx. You can tell it's the rustic sphinx by the purple stripes on its side. Um, so, and thought that they'll eat a bunch of different trees and shrubs. Um, and then another great determining factor of if it's a rustic sphinx is, is the little horn here. If it has rough horn, it is a rustic sphinx or the, a manduka rustica. But then they, their, their moth or their adult is just so beautiful. And just, just imagine how big those caterpillars are when they're feeding on your plant. That's how big the moths are, but bigger because they have a wingspan, but as long as that. Um, this is the great ash sphinx. So this guy is primarily going to be feeding on ash trees if you have one. Um, and then you could, the major difference between these two is that this one has a smooth horn instead of that rough horn. This is the white line sphinx. Um, so the caterpillars have a huge variety of colors that they can be, um, and they will pretty much eat anything they can find. But then these moths, they're just beautiful. The, a lot of people mistake them for hummingbirds because they're so big and so bright, um, but it's a, it's a moth. So it's all worth it in the end when your plants are a little, little broken down. I mean, you get these beautiful nocturnal pollinators that are just wonderful. Um, and these two are the tomato hornworm on the top and the, the tobacco hornworm on the bottom. So tomato hornworms, um, their hosts are obviously tomato. They also eat sacred detura, jimson weed, and other members of the Salonciae family. Uh, you can tell the difference between these two by the tomato hornworm has these um, curved V's on their back. And most often their little horn is gonna be a black color. Um, and then the tobacco hornworm on the bottom um, has seven diagonal stripes going across its body. And then their horn is a red and they will really eat anything. And these are their adult horns. Oh, so this is a picture of their cocoons. I've run into these a couple of times when gardening and they initially freaked me out uh, just because they were moving around and I was just, I didn't know what it was. And then I found out they were the cocoons and it's like, okay, so I just buried them again. Um, but yeah, so moth larvae, cocoons, these guys will go, so they'll fall from the tree, I guess, and then go down and bury themselves and make cocoons. And then they'll emerge from the ground, which is really, really <laughs> odd to see, but, but a beautiful process, I, I say. All right. So that's my introduction to some of our bees, bat, not bees, not bats, sorry. Bees, butterflies, and moths. Um, and I will talk a little bit about how do you create pollinator habitat. Um, so what you need is food, so floral resources, shelter and nesting sites, places to raise young and seek refuge from the elements, water source. So especially for bees and butterflies, they need a safe place to drink water from. Um, and protection, uh, mainly protection from pesticides is, is the biggest concern right now for pollinators, unfortunately. So food, floral resources. So when planting for native pollinators, you want to provide continuous blooms throughout the year. Uh, you wanna always plant native and you wanna plant diverse. So continuous blooms, so it's also called bloom time um, succession. Uh, the best way to go about this is um, a strategy that I learned from Karen Campbell, uh, which was just genius. She just opens an Excel spreadsheet, takes an inventory of what she has in her yard, 
when it blooms in the color that it's blooming. And so this is just an example. So if I had a wolf berry and I noticed that it was blooming in January and stopped blooming in April, I would fill in those boxes. Um, and then you can see once you do your whole inventory of your yard, where there's gaps in your yard. And so where there's gaps, you wanna find a plant that's gonna fill in those gaps. So you are providing the resources that early emerging native bees need or late emerging bees need. Um, yeah, so, and then you can make these little boxes different colors depending on their bloom colors. And so that'll give you a more aesthetic look to what you are missing in your yard. So if you notice that you have a lot of purple flowers and it's like, oh, maybe I'll look for something red or yellow. Uh, so this is a, a really cool way to kind of inventory your yard. And also just to kind of take notice of your yard and see what's going on. Um, to find like, when plants are blooming, um, Sinet, so it's S-E-I-N-E-T, is a great uh, resource for all the native plants in Arizona. Um, yeah, so that's just a good website for, for accurate bloom times and um, descriptions of native plants. Uh, so second, you wanna plant native plants. So why plant native? Uh, plant native because native pollinators and native plants have evolved to benefit each other um, and they're climate resilient. So they're adapted to our weather. They are adapted to the extreme heat. They're adapted to the drought and you will not be spending buckets of money on irrigation and fertilizers. Uh, lastly, you want to plant diversely. So plant diversity equals pollinator diversity. Um, a few ways to plant diversity is through structural diversity. So picture on the left is more of a, a larger landscape um, structural diversity. So you have your understory, your smaller grasses, your verbenas. Um, then you have your midstory, which are your, your bushes. Um, anything less than five feet, but bigger than two feet. Uh, and then you have your upper story or canopy. So this is like a larger, more ecosystem type based structural diversity. But then on the right, you have one that you can easily put into your yard, but you still have that structural diversity, but you're just using, instead of trees, you're gonna have like bushes be your, your top tier and then go down to grasses and, and ground cover. And then you always wanna plant in clumps. So we recommend doing three individuals of one species per like three feet or a meter. Um, that way these large blotches of color attract over, overhead pollinators and birds so they can see it. It's like an open sign for them. So you just want a big splash of color of one species um, and then just continue those splatches so you have a diversity of, of plants. Like this is a great photo representation of, of planting in clumps from desert meadows. So you have beautiful like dark blue, orange poppies, and then you have great um, pensum in the background. Want to say no to gravel and lawns. Uh, this is a one of my favorite habitat at home <laughs> moments when a woman sent me her before and after pictures of her yard. Um, so clearly she replaced all the gravel, um, which provides little to no habitat whatsoever um, and replaced it with just an awesome amount of native vegetation and native wildflowers. Um, yeah, and it reduces your heat island effect. Um, and this is just beautiful. One thing I did want to mention for, for bees and planting, um, bees can't fly as well as monarchs, obviously. Um, so if you do plant for bees, you just need to consider the forage distance between where they're nesting and where they are foraging. Um, 
So yeah, they're not able to travel too far between those two sites. So let's see. So large bees like your carpenter bee um, can only travel up to a mile between their nesting sites and their foraging sites. And then your leaf cutter bees, your sweat bees can only travel like less than a hundred yards. So it's important to have their nesting sites be close to your, your foraging sites. So I have a picture here. All right, so this is just like a simple garden design I kind of came up with. Um, so in the middle, you have your nesting structure for the native bees, whether it be ground nesting bees, which you just kind of clear off the space of bare dirt. Doesn't need to be large, even a foot by a foot is, is great for native bees to nest in. Um, and then you have your flowers pretty close by and you just continue to have your nesting structures throughout here. Um, but even in a, a yard that most people have in choose on the size of it, you're not gonna have any problems of having too big of a foraging distance for them. This is a garden design for butterflies. Um, so it's pretty similar to the native bee. Um, the only thing you're gonna do need to do differently is add larval host plants, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and then when you are doing, especially for monarchs, if you really wanna attract monarchs or queens, it's really important to have more than one milkweed plant. So just having one milkweed plant is probably not going to cut it or is definitely not going to cut it. So you want to put in at least three um, pretty close together. I think less than a foot just because when a monarch is done <laughs> demolishing one of those milkweed plants, it needs to safely get to the next one to continue feeding. So if they're too far apart, that gives it a long distance to be crawling around out in the open. So you wanna put them pretty close together so that they can easily go from plant to plant um, safely. Okay. So these are some of the plants that we have on our recipe card that are just like super for, for native bees and butterflies. So Greg's mist flower, um, it's a great ground cover. Um, it spreads really easily by root um, it attracts a ton of queens in the fall and, and monarchs if you get them. Um, but it's just that the Y in the garden, the, it is just filled with queens every year. It's amazing. Um, then Goodings for Bean on the right is an awesome native. Um, it's a great replacement for Lantana. Uh, looks pretty much the same, but it's native. Um, it, it can bloom year round. Um, pretty cold tolerant too. A lot of the lantanas died back during the winter, but uh, my goodness, verbena is doing great still. Um, and then these two look really great with marigolds or like a yellow flower. So desert marigolds um, or penstemon with some pink. Um, it's just adding the purple, the yellow, the pinks, just a great color palette, I feel like. All right, the next ones. All right, so these are continued great plants for, for pollinators. So dahlia species, this one's, uh, I pictured dahlia pulchra, um, but there are like trailing it. There's a lot of different dahlia species that are all really great. Um, so this one is the bigger one. So this one's like four to five feet. Um, it's an evergreen with beautiful silver green leaves and these beautiful lavender um, flowers. And it has a pretty good, really long um, blooming time from February to May. And at the Mason Center, we have a really great one that's always covered in bees, uh, just beautiful. Um, and then flat top buckwheat is awesome. So this can get pretty big. If you have like an awesome open space that you need to fill, but flat top buckwheat is, is a great option. with Just beautiful white flowers, white pink flowers. Um, yeah, it's beautiful. Um, great, so the next habitat need is shelter and nesting sites. All right, so for native bees, like I've mentioned a lot before, 
ground nesting and tunnel nesting bees. Um, this video Jenny McFarland took for me of just a bunch of <laughs> nesting bees just when she was out doing a survey. Um, just these, these females just going nuts and making their nests, it's just great. So to create habitat for ground nesting bees, if you have like an all gravel yard, you can even just scrape some of the gravel to the side and leave just a blank slate for these guys. They do like it a little bit sunny on southern sloping based ground. Um, so it's really easy <laughs> to provide nesting spots for ground nesting bees. Um, and then it's also good to just, if you have either an irrigation line or a spigot that you can just leave it dripping. Like once, well, especially during the spring, just like make a little mud essentially, just because that they like to provision their nests or like close off their tunnels with mud. So having a mud source is, is really great to help these guys out. Um, cavity nesting bees. So there's a lot you can do for these guys. So leaving your leaves, leaving your leaf litter on the ground or piling it up somewhere in like a basin or a flower bed so they have nesting materials is, is really important. Um, leaving your dead plant stems standing throughout the winter instead of cutting them back will create tons of, of habitat and nesting sites for cavity nesting bees. Um, if you don't have pithy stems that die back every year or, or you have an HOA that just makes you have a pristine house or yard, you can also create native bee hotels really easily. Um, I make some that are just out of a four by four with different diameter holes drilled into them. Um, and people have had a lot of success with them. Um, do you get a lot of questions about cleaning out native bee hotels? Um, and I have talked to and done some research on the necessity here in Southern Arizona. And what I've found is that because our humidity is so low, we don't have things growing inside of them. And because they're pretty small, you're not gonna be getting those, those parasites that, that the Eastern ones are getting. So from what I've heard from, from local people is that we don't need to clean them out, um, but we should probably like throw them away or do clean them out every five years. But if you're making stuff just like the ones pictured here that are just a four by four, it's easy just to make sure there's nothing in them and just throw them out and start over just to ensure that they're, they're clean. But we've had some up for a long time at the Y and they are still being actively used and we've never, <laughs> never ever replace them. All right. Oh. All right, so shelter and nesting sites for butterflies. Most importantly, if you want to have butterflies, you need to have larval host plants. And as you noticed earlier, there's are a ton of different host plants. So I would do research on, hey, what kind of butterflies do I want to have in my yard? Oh, okay. I want this one. So I'm going to look up what its host plant is and then plant it. So just learn and plant for what you want. And then it is important to have resting places for um, butterflies. And this is, they just rest on like shrubs, large shrubs and trees, somewhere that they could just hang on and just relax for a moment. That it's away from the wind, um, just shelter, shelter in forms of vegetation, like dense vegetation is, is perfect for them. They also need overwintering sites. And again, they love to lay eggs in leaf litter. So what I do is like I have an ash tree in the backyard. I just rake it all up and then stuff it into my garden beds or where my native plants are. So my HOA won't yell at me um, and just leave it there. And it's a great mulch and yeah, it provides uh, overwintering sites for, for moth and butterfly pupa. All right, so the third is water. Um, so for native bees, it's really important to have structures in which they can stand on. 
Um, so placing a few flat stones in a shallow plate or like a plant saucer is a great way to provide little islands for them to land on. Um, just yeah, make sure they're not submerged fully, but they do have a they they do have a place to land safely and dryly. And replace the water every few days, um, more often in the summer, just to prevent um, mosquitoes. Uh, for butterflies, they have puddlers, uh, so it's, it's pretty much a mud puddle. Um, so it can be done simply by leaving an area of your um, soil area in your garden exposed and have a have like a line dripping into it, um, or you can make a self-contained um, puddler. So you could put sand in the bottom and then put rocks on top, and then just make sure it's moist throughout. Um, so you don't need to have this out all the time, but when you do notice a lot of butterfly activity, just fill it up with, with water, but obviously not submerged so they can get those nutrients from the soil, um, like you can see on the bottom left. All right, and lastly is protection. So this is a big one. Um, as, we, as we know, there's so many uh, species of birds, and population declines, but it's it's happening in huge amounts in in our insect populations. Um, so unmanaged native bees are experiencing heavy populations declines. A significant proportion of native bees are at risk of extinction. Bumblebees have hit the been hit the hardest. Um, Twenty eight percent of bumblebees are witnessing major population declines. Uh, in addition to bees, 19% of butterflies within just the United States are at risk of extinction. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, the monarchs have had like a 99% decline in their overwintering populations. Um, oops, I meant to delete this one since I talked about it earlier. Uh, so the causes for decline um, changes in the land, so land use change, mainly due to urbanization and agriculture, uh, leads to the loss of foraging sites, um, loss of nesting sites, and climate change has increased our drought. We have warmer temperatures and more frequent extreme weather events. Um, and then, forgot to mention, but land use change in the urban and agriculture has also added so many pesticides to our landscape and neonicotinoids that have just pretty much been catastrophic to our pollinators. Um, neonicotinoids are systemic pesticides, so um, they can be thrown onto seeds, um, which will stay within that plant throughout its life into the nectar into the pollen, into the seeds, into your soil, and will stay there. Um, and neonics have been shown to cause all sorts of bad things to, to bees from, from being disoriented to not being able to reproduce and just being, and just dying. Um, so neonics are, are a huge issue. So how you can help is by planting native plants that are organic, that haven't been treated with pesticides. It's great places to find plants that are like that, or like desert survivors. Spadefoot Nursery is really great too. Um, the Desert Museum, any place that has like their native plant sale that are reputable. Um, so, We'll have a plant sale coming up and we get all our plants from Native Nighthawks Nursery who does not use pesticides at all. But there are great resources here in Tucson, which we're really lucky to have. They're all native and not treated with pesticides. But we, I, I can make a list of those too. If you guys need nurseries that are pesticide free, I can do that. Um, yeah, so leave the pesticides, shop for sustainable groceries um, and spread the word. Um, yeah, so 
We can also go the extra step in, and create habitat for, for native bees and butterflies. We could help them by doing it by ourselves in our own yards. Oopsies. All right. So this is precisely why the Habitat at Home program um, came up with this a la carte menu was to provide habitat, not just for birds, um, but for pollinators as well. So the Habitat a la carte menu allows homeowners to provide habitat for monarchs, caterpillars, bees, moths, bats, lizards, and, and it also includes um, initiatives that um, add to that safety of, of habitat. Uh, so Habitat at Home, just a little bit about Habitat at Home. I'm going over. Um, our mission is to create an enhanced bird, pollinator, and wildlife habitat in urban landscapes through education, individual, and community participation, recognition, and restoration. Um, you can find more information on our website, uh, tucsonaudubon.org backslash habitat. I will not go through all of this because we're out of time. So I will just put this contact information up. So if you have any questions, just email me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kim. That was uh, so informative, so helpful. Um, <laughs> I learned a ton and it makes me want to go out and buy a bunch of plants right now, even though um, my patio is all paved. So it's <laughs> hard to put patio, too many plants on there. <laughs> patio gardens make great habitats. I like well, living in an apartment. As soon as we have our plant sale this year, I'll, uh, I'll add a few you know. things. Still waiting for the word on that one. Um, so we don't have a ton of time for questions. Um, I just want to say that I put the Habitat at Home link in the chat um, for anyone who's interested. Um, also, we did have a, a request for you to throw in the link for that native plant website that you mentioned a few slides. Oh, back. sign it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That would Let be me. awesome. Yeah, I'll just add that really quick. Uh, and if you have any questions that we didn't get to, please feel free to reach out. Um, Kim is here to help. Our whole team uh, is here to help make sure this is as accessible as possible um, because it makes such a difference when uh, we have a lot of people in Tucson participating in the program and it, and it creates these little patches of habitat across the city. Uh, so it's really important. So we want to thank you very much for taking out uh, the last hour of your day to join us here today. And a huge, huge thank you to Kim for sharing all of her knowledge. Um, please be in touch. Uh, I'll send out an email um, today or tomorrow with the recording. Uh, I'll also include um, these great resources that Kim is sharing um, so that you can have links directly to those. Uh, so uh, thank you so much. Um, and I hope that you have a good rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.